sung songs so long that we sing them and even even when we sing them wrong we don't even know it and it's a refreshing thing every now and again just to go to the hymn book and look at the words that are there and read and i've uh, I guess I'm getting to be sentimental or weird or old or something like that. I don't know what it is, but I really enjoy opening the hymn book and reading the doctrine that's there, and that's one of the distinctives of believers. Uh, and so, anyway, John chapter 1 this morning, I want to encourage you, though, uh, during the song service, just worship the Lord Jesus. Just sing from your heart, make melody to the Lord, and sing because He put a new song in your, in your mouth. Isn't that a great thing that God has changed your song, changed uh, from from Charlie growling to being able to sing, and he sings pretty well considering all things being considered. John chapter one. John chapter one. That's true, isn't it, Charlie? That's a true story. Did I get it right? You growled before you were saved, and now you sing. Yeah, that's okay. actually I, that's where I learned to sing. It was in church. Yeah, he learned to sing in church. So he can he has a pretty good voice, he has a pretty good melody, but he can only go before he was saved. <laughs> Put a long-haired wig on Charlie sometime and you can see it. You can visualize it. All right. <laughs> John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And uh, we're going to be in verse 35 this morning. And I, I would actually like to read down to the end of the chapter. And we're going to look at the important matter of discipleship. John 1, 35. The Bible says, and again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to be, say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael saith, said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Good answer, huh? Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now we'll pray. Father, thank you this morning for this call to discipleship that we see with your disciples. And Lord, we just thank you so much that even though all these men were different, their master was the same, and that the experience that they were each as individuals able to have had to do not with their ability or their special uh, calling, but it had to do with who their Savior was. And I pray that you would help us to see similarities in our call to be disciples here this morning. And I pray that you would instruct us by your word, teach us some important biblical truth. We ask these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, before we get into the message this morning, let me ask a question. It has nothing to do with it. When does time change? Is that two weeks? November 2nd. November 2nd. So that'd be two weeks. It's two weeks, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Charlie says yes, so I'm sure he's right. Okay, good. The sun will be in a different place in two weeks. It's right in my eyes right now. And that's what made me think of that. So, well, listen, this is this is a passage of Scripture that in, in many ways we would look at and we would see it as historical. We would see it as this is, this is where Jesus called his disciples. Well, the truth of the matter is that is a fact. It's important to know where Jesus' disciples came from. And we know that these individuals were later going to be called the 12 apostles. Don't worry about it, sweetheart. I'm okay. My eyes just bothered me anyway. Um, the, 
uh, we know that the twelve that were called that that are called to be disciples here will later be apostles. And so, um, we one of the things that we find out in the church that's an important doctrine for us to understand today was that an apostle had to be chosen by Jesus Himself, and not chosen by a figurative Jesus in a vision. Let me just ask a question out of curiosity. How many of you have met somebody that has told you that they saw Jesus in a vision? One, two, three. None of these folks have ever seen. I don't know how many people I've met that, uh, and, and it's probably because I'm pastor. Sometimes I'll meet somebody. I never tell someone I'm pastor when I meet them. I just tell them my name or whatever. And we'll be in conversation, and they'll be talking and chatting along, and then finally they'll, they'll say, well, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a pastor. And as soon as I say that, they usually ask, what church? And I tell them, Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Oh, you're a Baptist? Yeah, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> I'm Baptist doctrinally, not denominationally. And so, yeah, I'm a Baptist. And uh, then immediately, I have to, I just, I hate to tell people what I do because I have to hear their version of what they know about God. And literally, you hear them off the cuff making up stuff about how spiritual they are and how aware they are of God, and then sometimes I get the vision. I saw Jesus. I was, you know, I had too much pizza, and then I mixed it with ice cream, and I was sleeping, and I saw Jesus, uh, and right there at the foot of my bed, you know, between the poster, and he told me, and you can never argue with what somebody, uh, with what somebody's vision of Jesus said in a dream. You can't, I mean, they just, no, no, Jesus told me this and this and this and this, and that's the most important thing. He said, don't go to church and uh, don't live different from the world, and <laughs> honestly, that's a lot of times the message that Jesus tells people, and you just think, I don't think Jesus told you that, because the Bible doesn't say that. Okay, why do I mention all that? Because uh, today, you'll meet people that'll say, well, I'm an apostle, or I'm a, I'm a prophet or a prophetess. I've met more prophetesses than I have prophets. Uh, people that claim to be prophets. And friend, an apostle was somebody who was chosen by Jesus. Not Jesus in a vision, not Jesus in a dream, but the Jesus Christ come in the flesh, the one prophesied by John the Baptist, whom John the Baptist looked at and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He is the one that called disciples. Now, I say that as well this morning to qualify that as we begin to look at Jesus calling his disciples to understand that this call to apostleship is not identical with the call to be a disciple. But there are 12 who are called to be apostles, but anyone can be a disciple. So when you study your Bible and you look at what the Bible says, notice the difference oftentimes between the 12 and disciples. For instance, at Jerusalem, when the Acts Church was started, there were 120 people waiting for the promise of the Father, and they were disciples. But the ones who got up and preached were the 12. Uh, but all of them were spirit-filled. And so uh, just I just wanted to point out the difference between an apostle and a disciple this morning, because it's important for us to understand that uh, and for a number of different reasons. Now, I want to see a couple of distinctives uh, of a call to be a disciple. First of all, the first distinctive of a call to be a disciple is the is the person or is your relationship to your master the relationship to the master I want to notice something here if you there are a couple words and phrases that are in this text that are repeated over and over and over again one of the words is the word disciple why because this is Jesus calling disciples what's a disciple a disciple is a learner a disciple is a student a disciple is a follower okay but another thing that you see a few times in this passage of scripture is the phrase which being inter or being interpreted look down at verse 39 and uh, notice which is to say being interpreted master you see that that in parentheses there that's in the in the original language that the scripture was given in the in the Greek language it's in parentheses in just the same way and it's interpreted why is that well let me ask you a question what does the word rabbi mean it means teacher right Okay, now, that, that's interesting. Look at, now look at verse 38. We're going to read that. And let's keep in mind that rabbi means teacher. Okay, then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They say unto him, Rabbi. Okay, what does rabbi mean? Teacher. Okay, so they say unto him, Teacher. Then notice that the Bible has parentheses there. Who did the Holy Spirit use to write this text? Who? And who is John? 
Who is John? This is not John the Baptist. This is John. The apostle. John the Apostle. It's Apostle John. Okay. Okay, now, do you think John knows what the word rabbi means? Yes. He does. Okay. Do you think that any Greek, English, lexicon, or dictionary could tell you that rabbi means teacher? Yes. But John said when he pointed out in the parenthesis, when, when the Holy Spirit used him to write this passage of Scripture, he said the word rabbi in the context of Jesus, which means teacher, he said which being interpreted is, which is to say being interpreted, master. Now that's a little different than just teacher, isn't it? Now I understand the disciple would have been the master. We call What do we call a school teacher in old days? School master, right? You ever heard of school master? School teacher, school master. Of course there's a big difference between a master and a teacher though. And a teacher instructs people but a master in a sense is the one who rules the people. And so understand, if you want to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't think this is in the Bible by accident because nothing is in the Scripture by accident. you believe that? believe that every single word of the prophecy of Scripture is given and it's given by the Holy Spirit and it's preserved. So if nothing is there by accident, why is it there? That's the question I ask a lot of times. Why would you say to somebody who knows what rabbi means, which being interpreted is master? Because the Holy Spirit wants us to know as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, who the master is, who the boss is. Um, <laughs> I've seen it before. I remember when I went to college. I gotta be careful saying this because it could be misunderstood. When I went to college, I never thought I learned much. In other words, I, I had a pretty good uh, background education before college. I, I was I was fortunate enough to get to go to a private Christian school, and so. When I was a freshman in college, uh, I would go to English lecture, and English was an absolute terror to kids who grew up in the public school system. It was just, they, they didn't teach phonics, they didn't teach grammar, they taught a lot of stuff, but they just, they really had a seriously deficient English system. And, they, when, and we went to, I went to private Christian college, and so the English was very comparatively rigorous. But I'd already had it beforehand. I already had the same curriculum grown up in it, and it was easy for me. And I remember in English lecture, I would work grounds right before English lecture my freshman year. And so I think they had like lab and they had lecture. And I, lecture is when you sat and listened. I think lab is when you actually had tests and homework. I can't remember how it worked. But you had English like, I don't know, th at least three days a week. You remember, Lee, is it three days, five days? It was a lot of English. Anyway, there's like yeah. two days of one and three days of the other or something like that. Yeah. So. Anyway, so I remember going into English, and I always sat by the poor unfortunates who didn't have a good um, high school education. And they're just struggling. I mean, they're working so hard. And you know what I did? I, I would get off grounds. I'd be hot. I'd go take a shower. I would eat lunch. And then I'd go to English lecture and lay down on my desk and go to sleep. And you know something? I think I only got a B or something in English, too. You know, you think if somebody's doing that, they'd at least make an A. But... <laughs> I was too slop. I mean, I, I think it was for turning in projects late or something like that. Anyway, uh, but my point is this. I didn't really think I had a lot to learn. Uh, I, I thought, my goodness, you know, you'd think in college they could teach you something you didn't already know about English. <clears throat> I was that way a lot, a lot in a lot of my classes. I thought, man, I'm ready to, you know, for them to really teach me something I didn't already know. One of the things I didn't realize was a lot of what a lot of what I was hearing I had already learned before, but there were a lot of little things that I didn't know. And by the time I graduated from college my senior year, Bible majors had to take what is called the Bible Comprehensive Exam. And um, when I took that exam, I realized, wow, I know a lot of things I didn't know when I came to college. I learned, I've learned a lot of things comprehensively, overall speaking, that I know when I came to college. And one of the things I realized is I've been really arrogant in the four years that I've been to college. I've been kind of like, you know, this is, I know what I'm here for, and I know what I want to learn. I know what I should be taught, and so forth. And I was a little different when I went back to seminary. And consequently, I think I learned more in seminary than I did in college because of my difference in attitude. See, when I came before, I was kind of like, okay, y'all are hired to be my teachers. And this is what I want to learn. But when I went to seminary, I said, I don't know what I don't know. And now I did know a lot of things I didn't know. 
<laughs> I realized I'd like to know more about this and more about that and more about that. But I just thought, man, you know, I w all the things I've realized before, I thought I knew everything. Didn't know I didn't know everything. If, if it's never occurred to you, you don't even know you don't know it. You ever think about that? There are so many things that for thousands of years people have thought and thought through and concepts that people have gathered that have never even occurred to people that you don't know. Now, two of the first disciples that were called, what were they, whose disciples were they before they followed Jesus? Well, John the Baptist. Who was the greatest man who ever lived? John the Baptist. You ever think about being the follower of John the Baptist? And then you're gonna go, well, you know what, here's the one that was fourth teller. I, I would think it would be difficult for a disciple of John the Baptist to transition to following somebody else. John the Baptist was the greatest man that ever lived. Um, you, in, in Luke chapter 11, when Jesus' disciples came to him, they said, Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So the disciples of John the Baptist, who would have been the first two that, were, that followed Jesus here, those individuals would have already learned how to pray from John the Baptist. They had a good education. You see this? And so when John says to, uh, when John says under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which being interpreted as master, he talks about the attitude that a disciple must have in order to follow Jesus. You see the importance of that? Hey, you don't come to the Lord Jesus and say, Jesus, now here's what I really think the church ought to be. Isn't it so popular today for people to talk about how to grow a church and what a church ought to be and what the different things in a church are? Um, more and more, I have had in the last couple of weeks people telling me, you know, great thing, great ideas for a church, and they have nothing to do with preaching the word. They have nothing to do with preaching the gospel. They have nothing to do with teaching uh, people to observe all things. They have everything to do with how to get people to come. You know something? I think Jesus knows how to get people to come. He said, um, "He said, I am meek and lowly of heart. Come unto me, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. My yoke is easy, he said, and my burden is light. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Do you think there might be some weary, heavy laden people in the world? There are people who are sin-torn, who are sin-worn, who are literally devastated in this life by their sin. And friend, what they need is not to come and tell Jesus what they need. What they need is to just come and say, Jesus, here's all of my mess, here's all of my sin, cast it down at the cross and receive uh, God's precious uh, atonement for sin, receive forgiveness for sin, and then just say, Master. God give us Christians that say, you know what, I don't know anything. All I know is that I want Jesus to be my Lord. I want Him to be my Master. Friend, one of the marks of discipleship, one of the important things that every disciple must understand is that he does not come to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is the kind of a disciple that I'm going to be. He comes to Jesus and says, Master, what would you have me to be? Well, that's pretty important, isn't it? Let's look at a couple more of those this morning, and we'll be through here in a little bit. He said, they, they asked him, they said, where do you dwell? And he told them to come and see. And look at down at verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, let me ask you a question. Who was the other one? One of the two, which, with one of the two disciples, which uh, heard John speak and followed Jesus. Who was the other one? Never mentions himself. He mentions Andrew. There's two that were following John the Baptist. It's John. So it was John and Andrew that followed. They, they were disciples of John the Baptist. Okay, now here's what, here's what uh, Andrew did. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, the Bible says, He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. What's that phrase again? Being interpreted. The Christ. Friend, understand uh, that many people today are looking for a Messiah. Matter of fact, Messiah is sort of a figure that you know we use as a, as a savior. We talk about the savior of the basketball team, the Messiah. You know, is the team going to get a Messiah? You know, the quarterback of the football team, the Messiah of the of the court of the football team. We talk about you know whatever a problem is that people don't have an answer for, they need a deliverer or a master. Well, the Messiah is the Christ. 
being interpreted as Christ. Christ is our Savior, but he's, the word Christ also carries with the same concept that we saw in, in the first interpretation, Master. It's Lord. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now look, look on uh, just a little further. And the Bible says about Andrew and Simon, or uh, Simon Peter's brother, he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now the second thing Jesus did when he called his disciples, when he called Peter to be his disciple, the second thing that we find Jesus doing is he renames Peter. He renames his disciples. He gives them another name. Isn't that the same thing that happens to us when we get a new name? We're given a new name. In Revelation, there's a portion of Scripture that talks about those that are faithful to Christ. And one of the things, one of the rewards for them is that they get a new name. And as much as I can understand that text, one of the things that is written is that it's kind of like a personal name, an endearing name, a name that God gives us. Um, I have a pet name for my wife. I won't tell you what it is this morning. I don't call anybody else by that name. I'm going to put it on my boat. I got a little boat that I'm going to paint. And I'm going to put the name on the boat. So if you want to see what pet name I call my wife, I have a boat here in the near future. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to name my boat after my pet name for my wife, okay? Now, the pet name is something that's personal, and it has personal meaning between you and that person. And when God saves us and God calls us, He's our master. But you know something? He's the one that gets to kind of give us His personal name and His own description. Can you imagine being Peter, Simon, son of Jonas? And Jesus says, your name is going to be, your name is going to be Cephas. And um, that's by interpretation, John said, a stone. Simon, you get to be the rock. You get to be the stone. Now, this is not, this is not Peter being called to be the Pope. This is Peter being uh, called to be the kind of disciple that he was. Peter was literally a rock for the rest of the disciples. Who was it that said, I go a fishing? Peter. Peter. Who was it was the first one that says, These men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day? Peter. Who is the one who was the, who was the first to lead in, in humility? My goodness, who was the first one to be restored to the Lord Jesus after denying Christ? Peter was. Who was the one that uh, when, he, um, when, he, uh, when he had assimilated himself or dissimilated, when he separated himself, Jews and Gentiles, and Paul rebuked him, got right and later on in 2 Peter said, my beloved brother Paul. Peter. Man, Peter was that rock. He was that stable, uh, solid disciple that, man, he'd mess up, but you could just always bank on it that Peter was just going to get right and he was always going to be there. And he'd always ultimately do the right thing. And Jesus, Jesus, when he called him to be a disciple, he said, you get to be that guy. Peter, Cephas, rock. Friend, when you follow the Lord Jesus, do you tell him what kind of a disciple you're going to be? Does he get to be your master? Does he get to give you your name? Does he get to describe you and what the kind of a servant you're going to be for him? Or do you tell him the way it's going to be? Listen, if you're going to be a, an effective disciple, you want God to tell you. Okay, now, uh, I want to just look at a couple more things here this morning. The Bible says in verse 43, The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and find a Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Okay, so now here's the second characteristic we find about a couple of the apostles. Look down at, at verse 40, 40 and uh, we'll see. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41 says, He first findeth his own brother Simon. And saith unto him, We found the Messiah. Notice in verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Another characteristic of disciples is that they point men to the Master. So many times, isn't it true that we are so fascinated by the disciple and we're not fascinated with the Master? Most people that make a decision to go to a church, um, I have found initially make a decision on whether or not the church has what they're looking for as far as programs. You, you know, if, if you're elderly, man, you want to have a good group of elderly folks and some activities and some things for you. If you're, if you're young, you know, you, and you've got kids, you want, 
uh, kids, you want to have a good kids group and kids programs and kids activities and things like, um, you know, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and stuff like that. It has nothing to do with what churches do, but you're looking for something like that. And if you're uh, single, then you want a good single group with a lot of other single people and hopefully some available single people that you can get together and interact with and have single get together. So people are looking for something and I've found that if you don't have what they're looking for the first time they visit, pretty good chance they'll never come back. But if they do come back, the thing that they ultimately make a choice on is whether or not they like the leadership in the church, whether or not they like the pastor. A lot of times that's really what it comes down to. I like the pastor. Fortunately for me, uh, in our church, I've got my wife and so she kind of offsets the likes and the dislikes. They always like her. And so they were like, well, I like the pastor, but I like his wife. She's nice, so we'll go to church there anyway. <laughs> anyway, but very seldom do they say, what does God want for me? What does the master want for me? Where would God, what would be the best place for me to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? We don't think like that very often, do we? We usually think, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. But very seldom do we just simply point right to Jesus Christ. And do you know something we fall into the same trap on the other side? Come to our church because we have. And we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this, instead of Jesus. If you come, then we will teach you about Jesus. You're going to know who Jesus is. You're going to find out about Jesus. You're going to grow in Jesus Christ. You're going to be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and you point to Jesus. One of the marks of a true disciple is that he points to Jesus. Okay, I want to just look at one last thing. Um, in verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming unto him. This is Philip who found Nathanael. Findeth that saw Nathanael coming unto him, saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now the word guile means no trickery or deceptiveness. It's kind of the same word that is used for Jacob's name, Yaakov, in the Old Testament, which simply means liar or deceiver or trickster. So uh, Jesus sees Philip coming. He says, here is an Israelite. What does Israel mean? Israel is the new name that Jesus or that God gave Jacob. It's, the, it's that disciple name, if you will, that God gave Jacob when Jacob came to a place when he wrestled with the angel. He said, no, I want your blessing. I want you, God. I want a relationship with you. And God changed Israel after that. And God gave him a new name after that. And he's a picture. He's not, it wasn't one of the 12 apostles or disciples, but that relationship that he had with God changed. And it's a good picture of what happens when you come to Jesus and you become a disciple. Now, uh, Jesus here, so when he uses the word Israelite, he's referring to the fact that Jacob was, when he became, when he stopped being a man who worked in the flesh, worked on tricking his, his brother, worked on tricking his, his, uh, uncle, worked on deceiving his family, worked on manipulating and trying to make things in life happen his way, and instead just worked on getting a hold of God, God called him Israel. So God says, behold, here is an Israelite indeed. In other words, a not liar and not Jacob. And Nathaniel is an Israel. He's a person in whom there's no guile. He's just honest. He just wants what God wants. God just wants the truth. And uh, so Jesus, when Nathaniel uh, when Jesus said that to him, Nathaniel said, Behold, which knowest thou me? Or where, when did you know me from? How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, and Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. You say, Pastor, what happened under the fig tree? Well, Jesus knows and Nathaniel knows. But there was a place when Nathaniel's under a fig tree. He's probably having an Isaac Newton moment, I suppose, hoping the figs don't fall. I'm kidding. On his head. Uh, now, if you've seen a fig tree, they're not really... Uh, they're they're not really a, much of a tree at all. They're kind of I don't know what you call them. I guess they're I guess they're technically trees. I don't know. Anyway, Philip or Nathaniel's under the fig tree, and Jesus calls him to be. Uh, I mean, Philip calls him and tells him, "We found the Christ. We found the Messiah. We found the Savior." But Philip Nathaniel had had a, an experience before Philip called him that he'd met God, or he'd asked God, or he'd made, he'd probably covenant to God, God, I believe that the Messiah is in this generation. I've heard what John the Baptist preaches, and uh, that the Lamb of God is here. God, I'm a believer in your Messiah, and I want to follow him. I want to, I, I want to, I want you to be my master. Whatever that, those words were that Nathaniel had with God, Jesus was God, and Jesus knew. And Jesus said, Nathaniel, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, I knew you, I saw you. 
And Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Now, what is, what is Rabbi being interpreted? Master. Master. Master, you're the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Jesus said and answered and said unto him, He said, Because I said unto you, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? He said, Thou shalt see greater things than these. And Jesus had confirmed something with Nathaniel. Nathaniel had either either given God some kind of a God, if this is the Messiah, you know, mention this that I was under the fig tree, or say this or do this. I don't know exactly the details. The Bible doesn't give us all the spelled out details for that. But we know this Nathaniel knew that Jesus was God by what Jesus said to him. And Jesus said, you believe this? He says, I'm going to show you some things. You're going to see some things. He said unto him, verily or truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. If you and I are going to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, it, uh, it begs that we must first be believers. To be a disciple is not the same as to be a believer. Uh, the disciples of John the Baptist had already been baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist. What was that? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were already believers. But when they followed Jesus, when they said, Master, and they left John the Baptist and they began to follow Jesus, they became Jesus' disciples. My friend, there is a difference between believing in Jesus and understanding that He's the Savior and allowing Him, and, and allowing him to be your master and being a disciple of Him. And there's also a difference, isn't there, between being an individual who is going to God and looking at the experiences that we think that we're going to bring and, and what we're going to do for God and how we're going to learn and how we're going to grow and just simply going and saying, God, I'm an empty vessel. Teach me. I want to cast my cares on you and you let you care for me. I'm going to give you my burdens and I'm going to take your yoke. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to yoke up with you and I'm going to do whatever it is that you've called me to do. And there's a difference as well between coming to Jesus with some kind of a secret motive and coming to Jesus with no guile, no trickery, no deception and just have a pure motive. I don't know why you're here. I don't know the motives of each individual's hearts. I would never pretend to. I always assume that the, the reasons people are doing what they do is because of what they say. I don't try to read in. You, know, you ever met the person who reads into everything? And you never want to write them anything because they'll interpret it and they'll take you wrong if they want to or they'll, they'll mean to take you to say more than you said or less than you said. Well, friend, what we need to do with Jesus is just say, Jesus, we'll take you however you want us. I'll be whatever you want me to be, and I'll follow you. I'll be your disciple. And let God have his way and his work in his life. You know what will happen as a response to that? Hereafter, you're going to see great things. Jesus said, you're going to see angels ascending and descending. I mean, he said, Nathaniel, you know that I'm God. You believe in me because of an experience that you had under the fig tree that I know about. But he said, I'm telling you this, you have a lot more to see. And friend, isn't it wonderful that when you follow the Lord Jesus, your great experience wasn't just your salvation. Boy, what a wonderful thing. But isn't it great that we have to, the opportunity as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Him, if He's our master, of seeing Him do wonderful things. And I believe that's our future. That is what God has planned for you. If you'll follow Jesus and you'll just be what He wants you to be, that's the future of Miami Beach Baptist Church. And I'm so thrilled, looking forward to what God can do. Let's, do, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much this morning for the truth that's in the Scripture. We do ask that you would instruct us and teach us, help us to have uh, good services to follow up in Fort Lauderdale. And Lord, I just pray that if anyone here this morning is, is not a true disciple, they're not really born again, and so they can't really follow you. Father, I pray that uh, you would help them to see their need for salvation first of all. Then, Father, if there would be any here that maybe they, they, they're believers and they're, they're born again, but they don't understand what a real disciple does. Well, I pray that that area of being, allowing you to be the master would be something that would sink in and take hold in the hearts of each individual. We praise you for what you'll do. We pray all these things in Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning. So glad that you all made it. And thanks for the temperature and the weather you ordered. It's been very pleasant.